Hey there, global history students. Today we are going to really jump into our looking at the classical world. Remember this time period between about 500 BCE and about 500 CE. This is where we're gonna see a whole lot of golden ages going on in a whole lot of different places. Lots of development of world belief systems and just all around some pretty cool stuff. So who better to start with today than the Greeks? Today we're going to be looking at the ancient Greeks, the ancient, what we can call the Hellenes, if you really wanted to use that term, because technically it's the more accurate one. Uh, but we're going to be looking at a very unique culture for its time, and one that's pretty darn important to us in the modern day, especially in the United States. Because if we look at the Greeks, the Greeks were really one of the first major civilizations to develop in Europe. Uh, they originated in what is today modern day Greece but also more around uh, the Aegean Sea and, and over towards what we can also call Asia Minor. Now, Asia Minor today would be modern-day Turkey. So they kind of made this horseshoe shape around this tiny little Aegean Sea, which branches off of the Mediterranean. Um, and even though they're geographically relatively small, they're going to be very, very important in the grand scheme of things. Now, the Greeks developed by about 600 BCE. Um, so in, in many ways, this is sometimes several thousand years after the, the beginnings of some of these Mesopotamian or Egyptian or Indus or Chinese city-states that we've looked at in the past unit. Um, but the Greeks really get going by about that time. Now, what makes them so unique was really their culture. Their culture was very different from a lot of the stuff that we've seen before. And in many ways, this Greek culture is going to form the beginning of what we can call Western civilization. And by Western civilization, what we really mean is like the basis of European culture. And because it's the basis of European culture, it's kind of also the basis of our own culture in the United States. So a lot of what the Greeks did are going to most definitely carry over to what we do in the United States every day. Now that's going to be helped quite a bit by the Romans, but you know, we're not at the Romans yet. We're talking about the Greeks. So a lot of what the Greeks did actually had quite a bit to do with their geography. As we've said, the Greeks were organized excuse me, around the Aegean Sea, which is in southeastern Europe. Um, and originally they had organized into these independent city-states, these polii. Um, and each polis, because the singular of polii is polis, each polis was its own independent city-state. Again, it would be like if Watkins Glen had its own king, its own army, and occasionally we went to war with groups like Odessa. Um, this is what a, a polis would effectively be. Now, why did they do this whole polis thing? Well, again, it was mostly because of their geography. Um, in Greece, you've got geography that really kind of looks like this. I mean, it's lots of hills, cliffs, jagged rocks, not always terribly easy to traverse, to move around in. Um, so it made for very challenging what we call topography. And topography in this sense just means differences in elevation or the height of the land. So sometimes you'll have these really low valleys and you'll have these very, very high hills and it's pretty steep in between them. The other problem that we see with their geography is that because they are organized around the Aegean Sea, they've got literally thousands of different islands that they're spread all over. So their geography made it really, really difficult to make one singular united country. So instead, they kind of end up doing this whole city-state thing. Now, even though they aren't one country, even though they're not going to have a united Greece for a very, very long time, they do still share a common culture. And it's this Greek culture that we're really going to be concentrating in on. Just one quick little thought before we move on. Um, this is actually a photo that I took from the town of Delphi. If you know anything about the Greeks, you probably know that Delphi was home of the famous oracle, which would be a young girl that these priests would bring in and she, she could supposedly tell the future. Anyway, this is the view from Delphi and you can kind of get a sense of that geography and why it's so challenging. You've got those two little lakes there kind of in the distance. You actually do have two towns, one in front of the lake and one on the opposite side of the lake. Those are modern day Greek towns, but it kind of gives you a sense of what I mean by how rugged this geography could really be. I mean, look at those cliffs that are kind of in the front of the image there. Um, so it's not always the most friendly to live in. 
But going back to this idea of Greek culture, this thing that does definitely unify them, there are a lot of things that these Greek city-states would have had in common. Um, for one, their religion. The Greek religion was very, very powerful. It was heavily polytheistic, meaning that you have many different gods and goddesses, uh, and each god or goddess would have a very different role. So, of course, in the picture there, you've got Zeus. Zeus would be the god of thunder, but he's also the god of law. He was the god of, of judgment sometimes, um, and he's the king of the gods, so he's like the god of the gods. Whereas you might have Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love, or... Um, you know, Ares, who's the goddess, excuse me, god of war, or Athena, the goddess of wisdom, Poseidon, the god of the sea, they all had various roles that they fulfilled. Um, and unlike many other religions, the Greeks sort of just saw their gods as like people with superpowers. They had their problems, they had their faults, they would occasionally, you know, um, do nasty things to each other, or they would sometimes, you know, sleep around. So, I mean, the Greeks were, were pretty much just horrible people with really cool superpowers, but they were gods. So this makes for a lot of very interesting works of literature if you look at a lot of like Greek mythology. Um, the Greeks also did a whole lot of different ceremonies and holidays that were related to their gods, the most famous being the Olympics. I mean, obviously we still do the Olympics today and it's not really a celebration of the gods as much anymore as it is a celebration of athleticism and coming together as, as a planet. Um, but it's still pretty important and it traces its culture back to the Greeks. Now, in the middle of all this mythology, we do have some pretty impressive works of literature that show up during the Greek period. The two most famous would be the Iliad and the Odyssey. These are two very famous epic poems written by uh, Homer, or at least we think they were written by Homer. We're not even sure if this guy named Homer was an actual person. Um, but still, they were very important uh, texts to the Greeks. Uh, people would read them, and both the Iliad and the Odyssey really encouraged Greek men to be strong and to be brave, especially in battle. And battle was something that came up pretty regularly between the different Greek city-states because there was so much competition between them. So even though they're, sh they're sharing a very common history, um, e each Greek polis would have some important cultural differences. And really, the, you can see this most powerfully when you compare... Athens and Sparta. So Athens and Sparta were probably the two best known Greek city-states, and really in many ways they could not be more different. So on the one hand you've got Athens, on the other hand you've got Sparta, um, and Athens tended to have a, a lot of very powerful characteristics. They had some very impressive architecture, beautiful artwork. Um, they really emphasized this idea of education, um, they were big into philosophy or different ways of thinking. We'll talk about some of their famous philosophers in just a second. Um, they had a very powerful navy, in fact, one of the most powerful navies of the ancient world for a pretty long time. Um, they were big into economic success. They were very wealthy. They did a lot of important trading. And they were really the birthplace of what we can call democracy, this idea of allowing ordinary people to participate in government. So all of these things really embody everything that Athens was. Well, if that's Athens, then what's Sparta? Well, unfortunately, I mean, uh, Sparta kind of has a pretty short list of what they're good at. What are they good at? Well, they're really good at killing stuff. The Spartans were incredibly militaristic. They would start training at the age of seven for battle if you were male. Um, even the women were, in fact, uh, trained to, to participate in combat, but more in the event that all the men died. The Spartan women would need a way to defend themselves back home. Um, and, yeah, it was kind of fun and cool that, you know, Sparta places all this emphasis on military stuff, but it, it does kind of affect their culture overall, um, where they're going to actually be pretty crappy at things like art and education and economic success. But again, both different paths to what they want to achieve. Um, and Athens and Sparta were two of the most powerful city-states of the ancient Greek world. Now, one of the biggest differences that you tend to see between different city-states was really how they chose to organize their government. Some polii uh, opted to have monarchies or kings. 
Um, others preferred groups of leaders, what we can call an oligarchy. So maybe they would have like a council of leaders. But there were various polii that preferred this new and kind of like up and coming idea that we call democracy. Now, democracy, or as the Greeks would say, demokratia, um, demokratia or democracy, it just means rule by the people. So you're actually allowing ordinary people to participate in some way in government. But democracy itself can, can be kind of a weird word. So let's throw two more definitions out there. One would be this idea of democratic government. So a, a government can be democratic. And what we mean by that it is that it would be a government allowing public participation in government. So you're, you're able to vote. The United States is in, I mean, we're, we're totally a democratic government. We allow our people to vote. That doesn't mean, however, that we're a democracy. Because a democracy, a direct democracy, is a little bit different from what you might see in the United States. In a direct democracy, you've got a system of government where every decision that's being made is ma being made with a public vote. So if you think about how much fun we all had during the presidential elections, um, that it would think about it being like that for every decision that the government needs to make. Do we go to war? Do we raise taxes? Do we invest in this program? Um, it all needs to be a, a vote by all members of the community. So usually groups like the United States are a little bit too big to have direct democracy actually work, which is why in the United States we don't really use direct democracy. We use what we call a republic. But we get our republic from the Romans, and so we're just going to have to hang on to that idea for just a second. Um, now, what's a little bit disappointing with the Greeks and their idea of democracy is really who was allowed to vote. Because even though the Greeks are running around talking about how important voting is and how equal, or, you know, equal people are, um, they're actually only allowing a very small segment of the population, particularly wealthy landowning men, to actually vote. The Greeks were a little bit sexist um, and not too terribly fond of poor people but we'll come back to that idea later on. Now, in terms of Greek achievements, the Greeks have a lot of important achievements. In terms of geometry, the Greeks really give us their version of geometry. If you take a look at the graphic that just dropped down there, that's the famous Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Well, it just so happens that Pythagoras was a very important Greek thinker. And a lot of our basic uh, geometric concepts come from Greece. So they're certainly going to use this in a lot of their architecture, but we'll come back to that in about two seconds. Before we hit that, let's take a look at their art. Greek art has a lot of very important concepts that continue to affect us today. Uh, ideas like perfection. They, the Greeks wanted to show how perfect the human body could be. And so you see perfect bodies, sculpted muscles, beautiful faces all the time. They were also big into this idea of realism. They wanted to show things as, you know, as they really appear, not necessarily all stylized and kind of funky. Um, in terms of architecture, the Greeks were really big into perfect uh, angles, straight lines, columns. Um, these tend to be like the hallmarks of what we see with Greek architecture, and certainly this continues to affect us today. If you look at a lot of famous monuments in places like Washington, D.C., they tend to be based on Greek and also Roman architecture. In terms of philosophy, the Greeks had a lot of very important ways of thinking about the world, and people like Aristotle or Socrates are really going to reshape how people in Europe think. In terms of medicine, the Greeks were really the first to develop modern medicine and various treatments um, for different diseases and all sorts of other ailments and injuries. Before the Greeks, there was really this attitude of, well, you're sick? Hmm, must be because the gods hate your guts. Whereas the Greeks are going to be one of the first groups to really step back and say, you know what, well, maybe there's something that's wrong going on inside of you, and I bet if we work hard enough, we can figure this out. In terms of literature, there are many famous works of literature. I mean, we've already mentioned the Iliad and the Odyssey, but there's also a lot of drama. Um, the Greeks were really the first to come up with this idea of drama and theater, and so there's all sorts of very famous writers of Greek um, drama, and, and you get your tragedies and comedies and all sorts of stuff that continue to affect not only our storytelling, but even like our, our movies today. Um, history. The, the first real historians, people like Herodotus and Thucydides, 
really came out of the Greek period. They wanted to report not necessarily on religious stuff, but on what was actually occurring in the real world. And then, of course, with government, the Greeks give us the idea of democracy. They give us the idea of voting and the idea of citizenship, actually being a citizen of a community. So there's so many different things that the ancient Greeks give us that continue to affect us today. In terms of philosophy, um, just kind of backtracking a little bit to philosophy, the ancient Greeks were fascinated by this idea of philosophy or using reason and logic to try and discover truth and solve problems within the world. Philosophy can also kind of simply mean just a, a different way of thinking. And the Greeks had a lot of very famous philosophers. One of the most famous would definitely be Socrates. Socrates was from, from the town of Athens, and his whole thing was all about the power of asking questions. He really encouraged his students to question the universe, to question why it works, to not just accept, well, this is the way that it's always been, but to really try and break those barriers and figure out the why. Now, this actually ultimately got Socrates in trouble because some of his students began to question the very nature of the gods and whether or not the gods actually existed. A lot of people in Athens didn't like this, and so they actually were going to, to kill him. Um, and Socrates took his own life before they could. So from Socrates, one of his most famous students is a guy named Plato. Not Plato, Plato. Plato was also from Athens. He wrote down a lot of Socrates' ideas. Plato was really interested in how governments worked. Um, surprisingly, even being from Athens, he actually hated democracy. Maybe he hated it because it was a democratic vote that pretty much demanded that his teacher Socrates die. Um, but he hated democracy. He actually liked the idea of monarchy, but he had some interesting ideas about how to make a good monarch a good king. One of Plato's most famous students was a guy by the name of Aristotle. Aristotle was also from Athens, um, and he had a lot of different ideas about a lot of different things. He argued that everything should be done in moderation, so as soon as you start doing something too much, you're going to go a little bit crazy, so keep everything pretty chill. Um, and he also played a lot with the various ideas of government, didn't necessarily agree with everything that his teacher said, um, but came up with some important ideas on his own. So let's very, very quickly just talk some Greek history. I know this video is going on a little bit long, but I'm trying to get it done all in one piece. So at the same time that the Greek polii were developing, there was another pretty important power that was dominating the Middle East at that time, and that was the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire was a major empire that was based out of modern-day Iran. Now, they were incredibly large, and they were very, very sophisticated. They were actually the largest empire in the world at that time. At that time, um, as much as 40% of all the people living on planet Earth would have lived within the borders of the Persian Empire. So we're talking it's a really, really big, big chunk of dirt. Um, they were incredibly technologically advanced. They were also very culturally and religiously tolerant. So if you've seen movies like 300, you actually have a really bad idea of what the Persians were. They were not this brutal, horrible evil empire. In fact, they were very culturally and religiously tolerant. Um, in fact, one of the Persian leaders, a guy by the name of Cyrus, was so good and so tolerant to particularly the Jews that the Jews actually, actually declared him a messiah, a savior that was sent from God. But as nice as all that was, the Greeks actually still hated the Persians, um, especially those Greek polii that were in Asia Minor or in Turkey who saw the Persians as a major threat. And actually, some of those Greek areas had been conquered by the Persians. And the Greeks didn't necessarily like being conquered by the Persians, regardless of how nice they were. So this is just a map of the big, bad Persian Empire. So anything that you see there that's in brown, that would be turf that was controlled by the Persians. So what, what countries are we talking about today? Well, there's Iran. Uh, that would be like the heart of the Persian Empire, but it would also control areas like Turkey, like what is now modern day Israel, Iraq, uh, what is Pakistan and Afghanistan today, Egypt, Syria, all these regions would have been under the control of the Persian Empire, even a little bit down into Saudi Arabia, uh, but the Persians weren't too keen on taking over that massive desert. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about this big, bad Persian Empire. It's huge. It's absolutely enormous. You would have been you know, talking about millions and millions of people. And by contrast, 
um, you've got a much smaller chunk of turf that we can really call the Greek world at this point. And so the Greeks were significantly smaller than the Persians, but it was one particular group, this group that we call the Ionian Greeks, that are really going to push the, the Greeks and the Persians into this like head-to-head -head conflict. And this conflict is what we're going to call the Persian Wars. So in 499, there were a couple very small areas of the, the, of the Persian Empire that were very Greek. They actually tried to rebel. They tried to you know, overthrow the Persians and, and regain their independence. Well, when this happened, a lot of Greek city-states, particularly Athens and Sparta, uh, tried to help these Greeks rebel against the Persians. Well, this didn't make the Persians too happy. In fact, the Persians sort of decided that those pesky Greek city-states needed to be dealt with and punished as a result. So from 499 to 449, both Greece and Persia will end up fighting what we call the Persian Wars. Now, this is going to be a major conflict, of course, between the Greek city-states and the Persian Empire. And, and it was pretty obvious from the beginning that the Persians were going to win. And if we backtracked to that map, I mean, the Persians are huge. They have armies of literally millions of people. Um, but what happens that's sort of bizarre is that the Greeks actually team up. So as independent as they were, and as much as some groups hated other groups, they actually teamed up in the face of this Persian threat. So the Persians tried several different times to invade, but each time they were turned back. One of the most famous instances of this is at what we call the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, which is where we get the famous story of the 300 Spartans, which by the way is completely inaccurate because it wasn't just 300 Spartans. They had the help of several thousand other Greeks. Um, but the Persians were repeatedly turned back and surprisingly the Greek city-states did in fact win the Persian Wars. Now when this happened, when the Persians were finally gone, Greece ended up being safe, at least for a little while. And during this period of safety, Athens actually became a major leader among the Greek polii, among these Greek city-states. Athens began this very brief but important golden age where we see all this great culture, all this great economic success, uh, it's during this time that mo most of the Athenian cultural achievements are developing. A lot of those famous philosophers uh, like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle kind of do their thing. And a lot of the credit for this golden age can really be given to a guy named Pericles. Pericles was a major Athenian leader. You've got his bust, his statue down there in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, so he's a major Athenian leader, and he really led the Athenians into this whole period of success. The question is how? Because yes, it's an awesome time for Athens, but it's really awesome for Athens because Athens really starts to pick on a lot of other Greek city-states. Um, Athens, and in particular Pericles, had convinced the other Greek city-states that even though the Persians were gone, they might come back. The Persians could be a problem for the Greeks again. And as a way of sort of getting ahead of this problem, um, Pericles kind of convinced all these other cities that they needed to sort of pool a bunch of money together. And if they had this chunk of money and the Persians came back, well, they could very quickly use that money to buy the armies and ships and everything that they would need to fight them again. The problem with this is that Pericles took a lot of this money and ended up using it not necessarily on public defense, but on Athens itself. And most famously, one of the things that Pericles spent money on was the Athenian Acropolis. Um, on the Athenian Acropolis, you have this enormous and beautiful temple that's called the Parthenon. Big chunks of it are still there today. Um, but a lot of this money was actually, yeah, well, it, it originally came from Athens sort of stealing it from other Greek city-states. So as impressive as this building is, it's kind of a little bit of a, a memory of how dirtbaggish people like Pericles were to some of these other Greek city-states. Um, fun fact about the Parthenon, there's actually a recreation of the Parthenon in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, one of the universities there has actually rebuilt it uh, almost to like exactly the, the specifics that would have existed in the Greek world, even down to the nitty-gritty details inside like a massive statue of Athena but that's just kind of beside the point. Well, of course, the other Greek city-states eventually picked up on what Athens was doing 
and two sides sort of end up forming in this. On the one side, you've got Athens and the few city-states that did actually support Athens. On the map that's on the right there, those would be the regions that are in the red. But then you also had another group that started to form, and these would be the people who didn't necessarily like what Athens was doing. And this group ends up being run by Sparta. So what we end up having here is another war. So the Persian Wars are over, but now we're going to have what we call the Peloponnesian War, which is going to be a major conflict between Athens, Sparta, and all of their allies. It's a pretty nasty war that's going to last from 431 until 404. And even though Sparta was awesome at military stuff, everybody pretty much assumed that Athens was going to win because Athens had all the money, they had all the ships, and they had actually more allies. But in 430, Athens actually got struck with a very nasty plague. Some pretty horrible disease kind of crept into to Athens. They ended up shutting the city down with the idea that they could sort of get rid of the disease that way. It didn't work. It actually killed thousands of people, including Pericles himself. So this plague was pretty awful to Athens, and because Athens wasn't really able to participate in this war in the way that they might have otherwise, it did ultimately lead to their defeat, and Sparta ended up winning this Peloponnesian War. And while you think that might be good for Sparta, it kind of was, but only for a very brief period, because um, some not so nice things ended up happening to Greece as a result of this 30 year long war. Um, throughout this whole Peloponnesian War, it had pretty well devastated Greece. There was a lot of fighting in a lot of different areas, so there was a lot of damage that was done to a number of Greek city states. Once all these soldiers came home from fighting, well, now what are they supposed to do? So there was pretty widespread unemployment. Of course, all through Greece, you saw widespread militarism, where the Greeks had kind of pushed away from culture in order to focus more on military stuff. And now that the war was done, what do all this, I mean, what do you do with all this military stuff? So a lot of democracies began to fail, governments began to collapse, and Greece was just not in a good shape. Um, so what this kind of leaves the door open for is a new power to come in pretty much from the north and a, re a region that we call Macedonia. So we'll get to this in our next video. Uh, make sure you've wrapped up your notes. Feel free to backtrack if you need, and don't forget to answer those five questions online.